Jordan, the Pearl of the Orient. A fascinating land with a culture that is thousands of years old. A land of colorful epochs and biblical history. All to be rediscovered in this Hasamite kingdom that was founded in 1946. Pharaohs, Assyrian kings and Persian monarchs once fought for this country. Nabataeans, Greeks, Romans, Byzantines, Crusaders and Ottomans. Each of them left their traces in Jordan. Jordan is situated in the Near East and borders Syria in the north, Saudi Arabia in the south, Iraq in the east and in the west, Israel. Welcome to Amman, Jordan's capital city. Here, poverty and wealth live side by side. At first sight, the city's ancient roots are not obvious. However, they date back to biblical times. The King Abdullah Mosque is the largest and, due to its striking blue cupola, the most beautiful mosque in Amman. Although only completed in 1988, it's an important symbol of Islam. Five times a day, the Muezzin calls to the faithful from its minaret. In around 1200 BC, Rabat Amon was the residential city of the Ammonite. But the first settlement was established on the Jebel al kala the citadel's 837 meter high hill. In the Bronze Age, a fortress was built here. It was later used by the Omeyads. They built their main palace on top of the hill. The small archaeological museum on the hill features exhibits that date back 10,000 years. Impressive objects of great historical importance. An incredible collection of stone and clay heads and figures all contained within this rather modest-looking museum. The centrally located Al Hussein Mosque is the city's oldest sacred building. Heavy traffic passes close to its shining white exterior. Here, trade is in the blood of the people. Thus, the souks are kept well busy with shopping, rendezvous and gossip. It's part of Arab culture to carefully examine the goods, to pick the best, and then to bargain hard about the price. In the 1920s and 30s, the city's elite had their houses built in the side streets of Rainbow Street in a special way. Jordan River design. Steep steps lead to the highest of the city's seven original hills and the black and white facade of the Abu Dawish Mosque. An exotic looking sacred building that was designed by a Turkish immigrant. From here there's a good view across the old town. Today most of the original Roman city centre is buried beneath modern roads and buildings but the ruins still highlight the dimensions of the original structures. Pompeius conquered the city in 63 BC and founded the Provincia Arabia. Next to the Forum is the Roman Odeon that was excavated in 1957 and has since been on display in all of its former glory. Music and various performances once took place here and the view across the hills made it a wonderful setting. Roman buildings that had become commonplace since pre-Christian times were also built in Philadelphia, as the city was then called, such as the Modarag al-Roman, the great Roman amphitheatre. 
theatres to entertain with plays and bloody animal contests. And because of its superb acoustics, it continues to be used right up to the present day. Next to the Roman Amphitheatre is the Folklore Museum. Here the young can also learn of their country's cultural history. Traditional Bedouin jewellery and drinking vessels are also on display. In 1900, the Ottoman Sultan ordered the construction of the Hejaz Railroad. It was designed to unite the Ottoman Empire that had begun to disintegrate, as well as to transport Muslim pilgrims to Medina in the Hejaz Mountains. Around 30 kilometers northwest of Amman is Assault, that is situated between two mountain slopes. Up until the First World War, this city, that had a good supply of water and enjoyed a good climate, was the main metropolis of Transjordan. At that time, Amman was only a small village. The ancient Ottoman town, with its characteristic lanes and buildings, was, unlike Jordan's other cities, left unscathed by battle. Since the 19th century, Assault was a city of traders who fully exploited its special location on the border of the Ottoman realm. The Wadi Essir is a fertile valley just outside Amman. Beyond the village of Iraq al Amir is Qasir al Abd, the palace of slaves, however, with some excellent views. Archaeologists estimate that in the 2nd century BC, a castle was built here by Hyrcanus, who belonged to the Jewish Tobiaden clan. The outer facades are decorated with splendid stone lions and the wall reliefs indicate a good degree of artistic skill. They resemble temple facades. The walls on the ground floor of the once two-story building were constructed with huge stones. Columns and the remains of various walls indicate the division of the numerous rooms of the White Palace. It was once badly damaged by earthquake. However, after 10 years of restoration, it was open to the public in 1994. The journey to the desert castles of the Omejadis begins south of Jordan's capital city. The winter residence of Kazir Mushata is no more. Only parts of it remain. According to the wishes of Caliph Walid II, the Qasir Mushata was meant to outshine all other places in respect of both its size and splendor. However, construction of the castle was never completed. The vision of the Caliph was thus never realized. Indeed, the land here contained insufficient water. Today, there is little of the once richly adorned facades of the Omeyad building. Over the years, it has frequently been plundered. In the middle of the 8th century, hundreds of forced laborers lost their lives during the construction of the gigantic but never completed desert castle of the Caliph. But it was for nothing, as the Qasir Mushata gradually fell into oblivion. 
On the southern Azraq Amman road is the impressive Qazir al Karena, the most well preserved desert castle in Jordan. This massive, fortified Omeyyad building cannot hide its military character. It's still plain to see, even today. The origins of the complex are unclear. Some historians believe that the Persians had this small fortress built. Strategic reasons also hinted the Persians, because due to the construction of similar fortifications, they had a much faster route across the desert. As little is known of the former masters of the Qazir al karena the former function of the building is also uncertain. not known if this desert castle was once a fortified complex or a trading center. There is a distance of 16 kilometers that separates the mysterious Qazir al karena and the desert castle of the Omeyyaden. On the other side of the wadi are the architectural remains of a fairy tale like hunting castle, the Kusia Amra. North of its main building is Amra's well house. Here, water was vital. From the well house, the water flowed through two pipes into Kursia Amra's nearby bathhouse. This unique feature made the hunting castle of the Omeyades famous. Amra's bathhouse highlights the luxurious lifestyle of the former monarchs in the east of Jordan. The most beautiful feature of the bathhouse is without doubt its wall paintings that contain various battle, hunting and bathing scenes. The steam bath also boasts a fine copula that features the northern star-filled sky. The three-aisled barrel vaulted audience hall of Kazir Amra contains artistic frescoes that feature scenes taken from the daily life of the Omeyyad monarchs. Today, the palace is open to the public. Travelling east, a number of trees indicate that there's an oasis nearby. The Qazir al-Azraq castle looks more like a fortress than a noble residence. It's believed that it dates back to Roman times and the Emperor Septimius Severus Diocletian, who ruled in around 300 years AD, improved and enlarged this Roman fortress. Today, the Qazir al-Azraq is entered by way of a mighty medieval basalt door. Indeed, Lawrence of Arabia mentioned this door in his famous reminiscence. The legendary writer and adventurer lived in this old fortress in the winter of 1917-18. Caliph Walid II transformed the Roman fort into a splendid Omeyyad castle. Azraq's proximity to the oasis was extremely beneficial. In addition to its function as a hunting castle, the Qazir Azraq was also an important meeting place for desert tribes. A 
A special pleasure that was on hand in the desert castles of the Omeyyads was wine. Here, beyond the strict cities of Islam, the monarchy could enjoy their favorite tipple. With the decline of the Omeyyad monarchs, the castle gradually fell into decay. 500 years later, the governor of King El Muadzim, who resided in Damascus, ordered that the complex be rebuilt as a strategic defense against the Crusaders. Our journey continues in a northwesterly direction. Monuments to the present King of Jordan line the road. Soon we reach the next historic remains that date back to Omeyyad times. The architecture of the bathing castle of Hammam as Sarak is reminiscent of the Kuzia Amra. Archaeologists believe that it was once adorned with mosaics and frescoes, but that they were plundered by various rogues and robbers. The water traveled from an 18 meter deep well next to the building, which was fed by a system of pumps. Likewise, the bathing area is linked to the audience hall. However, unlike the Kuzia Amra, the interior of the Hammam as Sarak has no wall paintings. The former Omeyyad monarchs ensured that everything was done to make their bathing facilities as comfortable as possible. Now goats and sheep often pass the ruins of the Omeyyad's castles. The history of the Qazir al-Halabat began in the 2nd century AD when Roman troops built a small fortress here. An ancient inscription indicates that the fort was again enlarged during the 3rd century. Next, the Byzantines restored it completely in 529 AD. When the Omeyyads came to power, they destroyed the Roman Byzantine buildings and built a new luxurious desert castle on this site. However, some elements of the complex still demonstrate how important were both decoration and design to the Omeyyad monarchy. Today, the ruined limestone and basalt walls display little of the former glory of the Qazir al-Halabat. A square-shaped mosque demonstrated the close ties of the monarchy to Islam. But only the caliph and members of his court were allowed to enter. Jordan demonstrates how human culture, art and civilization have developed. In the north of Jordan are the Jerash ruins. This ancient city was once called Gerasa, the Pompeii of the East. It was a member of the city alliance of Decapolis in the eastern region of the Roman Empire. The Romans built nothing in the Near East to compare with the buildings that were once here. Beyond the remains of a city wall is a classical Roman city that dates back to the first centuries that followed the birth of Christ. The most important buildings of the former city are still recognizable. An amphitheater, forum, colonnade, temple and baths.
The city was originally founded by the Greeks during the reign of Alexander the Great. Later, the Nabataeans extended it in order to protect their caravan route to Damascus. When the Roman Emperor Trajan took over from the Nabataeans and Jordan became the Provincia Arabia, the city was at its most prosperous. But with the fall of the Roman Empire and sea routes taking the place of the caravan routes, the city fell more and more into decline. Finally, in 747 AD, a devastating earthquake destroyed the city and the population fled. For more than a thousand years, the city lay in ruins. However, in 1806, German archaeologist Ulrich Jasper Isierzen discovered the once splendid city beneath the desert sand. Six years later, the discoverer of Petra, a certain Mr. Burkhardt, announced these discoveries to the world. Today, the ruins are a popular tourist destination and one of the most visited attractions in North Jordan. Close to Jerash is one of the most well-preserved examples of medieval military architecture, the Kalat Ajlun Fortress. Amir Iz Usama, a relative of Saladin, had this fortress built on a 1200 meter high hill in 1184. Kalat Ajlun was meant to be a defense against the approaching crusaders and also to protect pilgrims on their way to Mecca. Under the rule of the Mamelukes, the fortress was extended and a moat was carved into the rock, although it was never filled with water. The fortress towers, stairs and many rooms are a veritable labyrinth and indicate its former size and importance. When in 1187, Sultan Saladin won the final battle against the Crusaders, the Kalat Ajlun fortress was no longer used. Later, the Ajlun fortress was attacked by the Mongols, but they did little damage. So it was not battle, but an earthquake that in 1837 destroyed the fortress whose ruins are still visible today. South of Amman is the city of Madaba that was mentioned in the Bible. It is referred to in the Old Testament as the location where the 12 tribes of Israel met. The St. George Church is world famous. It was here that the huge Palestine mosaic was discovered, an ancient map of early times. In order to protect it, a church was built over it. The Romans built a number of military bases here, and during the Byzantine epoch, 14 churches were also built in this area. Today, the churches are museums in which valuable mosaics are on display, such as the floor mosaic in the Apostle Church. This work of art was discovered in 1902 by a priest 
It was created during the construction of the church in 578 AD. The Madaba Museum in the south of the city features the ruins of a church with a wonderful floor featuring lively looking motifs. It's been well restored. Sections of floor mosaics from other churches and residential buildings are also exhibited here. Madaba is a synonym of ancient mosaic art. A school was once located here. The traditional skills of this region are a delight to see. Although we're gradually tracing the roots of ancient times, modern life is never far away. At an altitude of 800 meters is a place of great significance for the Jewish and Christian faiths, Nebo Mountain, where God spoke to Moses. This was the view Moses had when God showed him the promised land for the first time after his 40-year journey from Egypt. He looked across the Jordan Valley and God said to him, This is the land I promised to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. In the early morning, there's a splendid view across the Dead Sea as far as Jericho. And in the mist is Jerusalem. Siaga is a church and monastery ruin on Nebo Mountain that was discovered in the 1930s by Franciscan monks. Over the years, several sacred buildings have been built on this site. And archaeologists believe that this is the exact place where Moses looked over the land for the first time. And they also believe he may have been buried here. The Dead Sea is situated in a sunken Jordan-Israeli rift valley. 400 meters below sea level. It's one of a large system of rift valleys that extend from Turkey to East Africa and originated millions of years ago due to tectonic displacement. Today the Dead Sea is a popular tourist attraction with visitors from around the world. International hotels proliferate here, and the infrastructure grows day by day. The local thermal baths are ideal for diseases of the skin, as their healing waters have a high content of mineral salts. Images of people floating on the water's surface or covered in mud are well known all over the world. Several inlets, but not outlets, are responsible for the high content of salt. In this, the largest inland sea in Jordan. Um ar Rasas, the Kastron Mefa'ar of antiquity, is one of the most mysterious archaeological sites in Jordan. Today, this ancient settlement is tantamount to a field of ruins. Even now, it's not known how many treasures still lie undiscovered here. New discoveries always arouse much excitement. Originally, Castron Mefa'ar was a small fort that contained the Roman cavalry, the Notitia Dignitatum.
With the decline of the Roman Empire, this military outpost on the edge of the desert was abandoned. When the Romans vacated this region, it continued to thrive. A settlement of the Gassanidae and Byzantine people was established here. The wonderful treasures of the Byzantines are often to be found only a few centimeters beneath the ground. It appears that these people were members of a then new religious group called Christians. Indeed, it can be shown that the tiny settlement once possessed seven churches. Thanks to the Italian archaeologist Michele Picirillo, the mosaic decorated floors of two churches were discovered here. Cultural treasures beneath the desert sand, where shepherds graze their animals. The ancient King's Road travels from Amman in the south. It is a route that passes through a fascinating landscape and connects Syria with Egypt and Arabia. Several bends lead down the overwhelming Wadi Mujib Canyon. On one side of the canyon we descend 500 meters and on the other side the road winds up once again. An artificial lake was created at the bottom of the wadi. It is supplied by a tiny creek. In biblical times, it was used to divide Moab and David's realm. The King's Road leads further south to El Raba. This place was referred to in the Bible as Ar Morab, but today only Roman ruins can be seen here. A temple built above a Byzantine church. Later, this Roman temple complex was used as caravanserai. It's amazing how throughout history, various buildings have been replaced by one or more on the same site. The Wadi al Hassa is tantamount to being a large ditch between Jordan and the Red Sea. It is the biblical divide between the realm of Moab in the north and Endom in the south. It separates two quite different landscapes. The terrain here is increasingly rugged. The hilly limestone landscape of the north is transformed here in the south into cleft valleys and tapered sandstone needles. An extraordinary natural phenomenon. The name Endom means red and indicates the color of the sandstone mountains that extend from the Nabatean town of Petra to Wadi Rum. Phosphate for export is worked in this 800 meter deep canyon. Along with his animals, a shepherd wanders peacefully across the wild terrain. This strategic location at the entrance to Wadi Kirak that leads to Palestine has always been a favored possession of the various monarchs who have owned it. The Crusaders built a mighty fortress on top of this 950 meter high hill in the early part of the 12th century. The fortress was once only accessible by way of numerous narrow corridors that were carved into the rock and well hidden beneath its impressive facade. After the Crusaders, it was the Arabs who took control of Al-Kirak. 
1263, they expanded the fortress in typical style. The first deed of Saladin, the commander of the Muslim army, was to publicly behead the master of the fortress, Reinald von Chatelon, and to impale his head on the gate. A labyrinth of endless dark corridors, courtyards, cisterns and mighty halls indicates how somber life was during the Middle Ages. Al-Kirak was an ideal location from which to control the traders and pilgrims who travelled between Damascus and Mecca, and also from which to launch hostile action. Due to its location, the fortress was virtually impregnable, but as it lacked a regular supply of water, after eight months of siege, it was abandoned. Earthquakes and constantly changing ownership often change the appearance of this mighty fortress. The next fortress also has a colourful history. King Balduin of Jerusalem ordered the construction of the Shubak Fortress in 1115 and named it Montreal, the King's Fortress. It was the first outpost of the Kingdom of Jerusalem and was then surrounded by fertile land, unlike the barren landscape of today. At its peak, more than 6,000 Christians lived here each one of them a crusader and a member of the armed pilgrimage to the Holy Land. After a persuasive speech by the Catholic Pope Urban, the first crusade was organized in 1095 and the Militia Christi joined the cause. At first, the Muslims were disorganized, so Jerusalem fell, its inhabitants massacred. At the beginning of the 12th century, the Crusaders conquered the entire Syria-Palestine coast, and in their first flush of victory, they founded a number of Crusader states. Then, the Muslims gathered under the flag of the Holy War against the infidels. And finally, Saladin succeeded in the Battle of Hittin, and the Crusaders were finally defeated. Close to the world-famous Red City of Petra is Al-Baida, a small city, but one that is similar to Petra in many ways. Petra Minor can only be entered by way of a cleft within a narrow canyon where the landscape features various red sandstone formations. It was an important settlement during the Stone Age when the first hunter-gatherers settled here and farmed the land. Stairways, walls and caves were carved into the soft sandstone and there was also a good supply of water. The many cages in the steep rock walls look mysterious, as though primeval man will suddenly appear. As they settled close to this location a thousand years later, 
Did the Nabataeans gain their architectural inspiration from this place? Or did the Nabataeans subsequently transform the original settlement according to their own plans? Near Wadi Musa, the Valley of Moses, is the fascinating and legendary rose-red city of Petra. Its strategic location at the junction of six important caravan routes, including the famous Incense Road, brought much prosperity to the city. The most impressive route to Petra travels through the Sikh, a narrow gorge with huge sandstone walls. There are only two routes that lead to the rocky city of Petra, a narrow mountain pass in the northwest and to the east the sometimes 200 meter deep Sikh gorge. In 1812, John Lewis Burkhardt was the first European to enter the ancient Nabataean capital city of Petra. The treasury symbolizes the golden period of the Nabataeans, who in the 4th century BC became wealthy due to trading spices, frankincense and silver. However, their newfound prosperity did not go unnoticed. Their neighbors strove after the fortunes of the Semite people who originally came from Arabia to this region of Jordan. Due to the strategic location of their capital city, in 312 BC the Nabataeans avoided conquest by hostile armies. Prosperity first came in the 2nd century BC with the demise of the Diadox. The former tent city was replaced with stone buildings. The high places or altars that were used for animal sacrifice were of much significance. The most important high altar lies in the southwestern area of Petra at around a thousand meters above sea level. The Romans also discovered the hidden city and settled here. They built an amphitheater with seating for around 6,000 on 33 rows of stone seats. There was also a colonnade that crossed the center of the inner city. Each side was lined with columns and large buildings. The Bedouin name, Fortress of the Pharaoh's Daughter, has no connection with the original function of this well-preserved Nabataean building. There are several royal tombs from the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. The tomb of the Urns has a front hall with four statues. The tomb of silk. The Corinthian tomb that has a facade that resembles the treasury house in Petra. And the monumental palace tomb. A small mountain path leads from the west of the valley through the Wadi Kararib to the site of Ed Dia, a monastery. Petra still possesses a fascinating and mysterious atmosphere. Now we have reached the south of the country. 
the harbour town of Aqaba on the Red Sea. Its beaches and exclusive holiday resorts are extremely popular. Numerous water sports are also available here. Glass bottom boats provide an impressive glimpse into the underwater world of the Gulf of Aqaba. An intriguing sight. Kaaba's port is vital. It is Jordan's most important commercial harbour. This city is an important junction of trading routes that cover both land and water, and it has a long history. As does the Mamelukes castle. It was built in the Middle Ages, but during Ottoman rule fell into decay. However, during the Arabian War of Independence, it was used once again. An aquarium provides an opportunity to see the exotic fish that inhabit Aqaba's crystal clear bay. A colourful spectacle. Around 20 saltwater tanks contain some of the Red Sea's most interesting fish. A shining variety of various species that gradually evolved in this region. The sunsets here are quite spectacular. Around 50 kilometers from Aqaba is one of the most fascinating desert landscapes in the world, the Wadi Rum. Despite its desolate terrain and hostile environment, the Wadi Rum region was first inhabited several thousand years ago. No other author has written of the Wadi in such a colourful way as the legendary British author, archaeologist and secret agent Thomas Edward Lawrence. The history of Wadi Rum's various settlements dates back to the Stone Age and the 9th millennium BC. At that time this area was not as barren and arid as it is today. Thus, the settlers here farmed the land and bred livestock. Since the 4th century, this desert area has also been most important. Caravans of the legendary Incense Road were controlled by the Nabataeans. The unique landscape of this desert valley is the result of numerous processes of erosion that have gradually created its fascinating scenery. One of the most popular destinations in this region, and also one of the most famous landmarks of the Wadi Rum, is the imposing rock bridge situated at Jebel Burda. The Wadi Rum was a sacred place for the Nabatea tribe. The ruins on the edge of this high rock wall are the remains of a Nabataean temple that dates back to around the 1st century AD. But this desert also has a dark side. Drug barons and arms dealers attempt to ply their trade here. However, the legendary Bedouin police are a force to be reckoned with. The Wadi was in the spotlight once again when it featured in the motion picture Lawrence of Arabia. However, it took several years for this barren landscape to be made readily accessible to tourists. An overnight stay in a desert camp is the perfect way to experience Arabian life, its food, music and dance.
The men danced to the fiery rhythms and the persistent melodies of the doodlesack, a type of bagpipe, beneath the clear night sky. Desert romance, culture and fascinating natural wonders. The exotic realm of the Bedouin is a taste of oriental history. To travel along biblical routes, to experience the promised land, to visit the Red Sea at dusk. A land of crusades, Roman cities, impregnable fortresses and mysterious desert castles. Jordan, a priceless gem located in the Near East, with all the magical romance of the Orient.